Patty Bernard and I am a member of the Nevada Women's History Project. Today is Thursday, August 10th, 2017. We are interviewing Lynn Atchison, Truckee Meadows community leader. And this interview is a part of the Robert Z. Hawkins grant that the Nevada Women's History Project received in November of 2016 to interview women of Nevada. Thank you so much for interviewing with us, Lynn. It's a pleasure to uh, talk with you. And I'd like to start out by asking a little bit about your formative years, your parents, your schooling, um, those types of information. Well, first, let me say thank you to you and the Nevada Women's History Project for doing this and certainly to the Hawkins Foundation for this generous grant. It's a real honor to be part of this. Um, I was born in Ely, Nevada, 1940. Uh, we lived in McGill, and uh, my father worked for Kennecott Copper. My mother was a teacher. She had graduated from the University of Nevada. Uh, my father was just a high school graduate, which was typical of many people in those days. Um, but grew up uh, really in other parts of Nevada. We moved from Ely uh, when I was about three years old, and we moved to Reno. Uh, from there, um, I've lived in Carson City and uh, then back to Reno, went to, uh, to junior high school here, and then went to Reno High School. Then on, as many of us did then, we went right on to the University of Nevada. Uh, and I was a teacher. Uh, what else were you in those days? You were a nurse or a teacher. So I followed in my mother's footsteps and uh, got my degree from the University of Nevada and I uh, majored in secondary education with a, uh, I had a major in English and a minor in physical education. And where did you teach? I taught, uh, my first year I taught at Trainer Junior High School and I taught core teaching, uh, which meant I taught all subjects, which was <laughs> baptism by fire because you're not taught <laughs> in college. When you major in English, I was pretty good at teaching English and physical education, but I really had to study for science and math and uh, social studies. But it was a wonderful school. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Ed Kane was the principal and he had been in Carson City. I had known him uh, before. Marge Titus Scott was uh, my mentor and uh, she taught physical education was and oversaw the physical education department. Sam Macias was there and he was a coach. Uh, it was just really a wonderful school. One of my classmates, uh, his name was Lynn Stotts, his mother was a teacher right next door to me so we would share our brown bag lunches and talk about our students and it was just a great, great experience. The students then came from the Black Springs area so we had a lot of low income uh, youngsters and then we also had Stead Air Base so they were uh, military children and they were very polite and yes ma'am no ma'am and uh, just such a fun experience it was a great way to start teaching and then you went and then from there um, I got married and uh, my husband and I had dated for seven years uh, Jim Atchison, and he had been in medical school one year at the University of Utah School of Medicine. So we decided to wait and, and let me teach one year before we got married. So then I, we were off to Salt Lake and I taught there. I taught junior high again. I taught at Ju uh, Irvine Junior High School and uh, while well, he went to medical school and um, I taught and uh, spent a lot of time alone <laughs> because medical school was certainly very demanding. But uh, again, uh, we developed friendships that we still have today, and uh, that was, again, a very nice experience. We stayed there uh, for his four years of medical school, and then he uh, was accepted and, uh, at St. Louis City Hospital and on the Barnes unit in St. Louis for his internship and residency. So off we, we had, our, our first child was born in Salt Lake, little Celeste, and so we piled into our little MGM, a uh, little MG, I guess it was called, and off we went to uh, a whole new world in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where he did his internship, and again, alone quite a bit because he worked 24-hour shifts and maybe got home for a few hours to sleep and then 
back to City Hospital or to a Barnes Hospital. Uh, but again, fun place to be and our son Jim was born in St. Louis. I went to Central Junior High School and Central was the old Reno High School at that time. And you can see that's a little cheesecake. <laughs> nice that was car. a very nice uh, Ford car. That was my uh, brother-in-law's car and uh, quite hep for that, uh, that time. But that, uh, going to school at, at Central and still have friends who we shared Central Junior High School together. And you walked? Yes, school. we lived in Westfield Village, and Westfield has a fascinating history. You know, it was really the first kind of planned community that was built in the Reno area. And uh, so we lived in Westfield, and up the street were the Whittemore children, and uh, Harvey and all his sisters, and uh, I used to babysit for them. So I had great babysitting jobs because they're all young families that lived in Westfield Village at the time. So there are a lot of uh, people who, uh, Don Wells uh, lived in, in Westfield Village, and uh, we just had uh, a lot of fun in the neighborhood because so many young kids were living there at the time. This was a, a, a new life for you then in St. Louis? Yes, absolutely. And um, after Jim's internship, you came back to Reno? Yes, he interned uh, at uh, City Hospital in Barnes, and uh, then, Came, no, we moved back to Salt Lake City where he did a uh, chief residency and a fellowship in endocrinology. He decided uh, he would be in, he was, his course of study was internal medicine with a subspecialty in endocrinology, diabetes, growth hormones, those types of things. So there was a professor there who was quite well respected and, and renowned in endocrinology. So he chose to go back to uh, Salt Lake City. So we spent another three years there while he did his internship and two years of fellowship. And then he was ready <laughs> to finally make some money and go into practice. Uh, so we, then we moved back to Reno. We moved back to Reno in 1972. So we had been gone, uh, I'd been gone eight or nine years. So moving back was all new. All my friends from school, you know, were all settled and, and uh, were on their way. So it was really like starting over when we moved back to Reno. But I had the good fortune to have a friend down the street who was Fritzy Erickson. <laughs> and uh, Harry Erickson and my husband had been worked together in college and on pole line construction. So they were, they were good friends, and, and uh, Fritzy and I, of course, were in high school. She was a little ahead of me in high school, but we're friends. And our kids were all about the same age, so that struck up a great friendship. And is that how you then got involved in the community? Well, it started there because our um, friend, uh, my husband's friend's fraternity brother, Jim Santini, uh, in uh, 74, I believe, decided to run for Congress. And he called up my husband to say, would you help me in my campaign? And my husband, uh, good at passing the bucks, said, oh, no, I'm not interested. I'm too busy, but call my wife. <laughs> so I started, and this is a big part of my life. And I think it is, when I talk to young people, I say, volunteer as much as you can, because it, it affords you all sorts of opportunities that you may not otherwise have. So I volunteered in his uh, Senate campaign, or not his House of Representative campaign. And uh, then when he won the election, I went to work in his uh, Reno district office. And he had a person who was his district office manager at that time. So I was his scheduler. I did his all his appointments. And uh, uh, that worked out pretty well. And then his... Um, his office manager decided to, uh, that she was going to retire. So then I had the opportunity to run his office and, and hire staff. And that's when I was able to hire Fritzy Erickson and Kay Zanino. And the, the three of us uh, were all pie thighs. Uh, of course, Fritzy hadn't attended the University of Nevada, but uh, Kay had. So they, uh, the three of us uh, ran his office. For, uh, for a number of years until he decided to run for the U.S. Senate. That's
That must have been really interesting. Did it was. Did you have some, some wild Yes, tales? yes, we did. And uh, I'm sure Fritzy will share a couple of them. But uh, it was fun doing constituent service and, you know, helping people with problems. Many of them were, uh, and this was also kind of a defining moment in my life. I realized that many women were reaching their mid-60s. Their whole life had been devoted to their husband. They had been stay-at-home moms, and their husbands had had careers. And uh, then their husbands died, or uh, and they had nothing to do. They had no support. And so it really started me thinking about how important it is to have balance in one's life. and. Uh, my mother had always worked, but I thought then, I really do want to have more to my life. And staying home is wonderful. It's perfect for a lot of people. My daughter is a stay-at-home mom, and it's perfect for her. But for me, uh, it, working was really important. And the volunteer op opportunity with the Santini campaign afforded me that job because I'd been a teacher by training, but this was something entirely new, running a district office and uh, doing constituent service and, and shuttling a congressman around. and uh, So it was, it was exciting and, and new, very new. What were some of the issues that you dealt with? A lot of them were dealt with, uh, that go back to the women issue, women issue that uh, was Social Security. And their husbands had passed away. They were dependent upon Social Security and that was their entire income and the struggles that they had, um, you know, living with just being on Social Security. And some had retirement, but um, many of them d depended uh, solely on Social Security. And Jim was big, uh, Santini was very big with senior citizens. So we spent a lot of time at senior citizen centers and I began to appreciate issues of the elderly and, then, and widowed women and uh, those that didn't have much to fill their lives. Uh, and that, that kind of was the sad part, that they hadn't, they'd been at home for many years and you know, hadn't been able to build relationships. And children many times were a part of it, but many times they weren't. So uh, figuring out uh, that, that was a, a good lesson in my time in his, his office. And then I also ran his campaigns, I would go out off his district office staff because that was paid by the government. So I would go off that salary and go and do his campaign work. He ran four times while I was uh, on his staff. So that meant going out to the rural areas yes, of so Elko, mm -hmm. Eureka. Mm -hmm. What were their issues compared to what you normally saw? In Which the they still are today, the Bureau of Land Management and big issues on land and grazing rights mineral rights. Uh, Santini was very big in the mining industry and uh, his was more hard rock mining uh, because of gold and uh, so he was a strong advocate for those uh, the mining companies in this and a very articulate one I might add and he knew that uh, those issues very well so he was a great representative for rural Nevada. Uh, some uh, agricultural I issues uh, but big were uh, rights to grazing rights and that so much of our land was owned 87 percent by the federal government and uh, trying to get out from under the Bureau of Land Management. Did you also meet women's issues in those areas? Yeah, he, we did somewhat. Uh, he was not um, a big advocate of, um, well, I shouldn't say that. He, he was not he, uh, pro-choice. He and his, he had uh, married a second time and he and his wife Anne's uh, first child was a spina bifida. And many at that time might have considered abortion, but he really valued life. And uh, of course he was Roman Catholic also, so I think that, and she was Mormon. So he, but he didn't make that an issue, and he knew all of us were certainly pro-choice, but uh, it was never, uh, you know, an issue in our office. But uh, I think more, it was not really defined as women's issues, but certainly we were, because we were helping a lot of women 
with issues that they were dealing with with Social Security or uh, with some federal uh, department that uh, was having they were having problems with but primarily it was Social Security. Do you have a memorable uh, memory of, of going out into the interlands? In the, in the rurals? Uh, well, th the memories I have is when I go back now, I just remember all the wonderful people I met uh, who I hadn't known before, the Lipparellis in Elko and, and uh, uh, then college friends, the Monahans who had moved to Winnemucca. And uh, it was renewing acquaintances and uh, being born in Ely, I certainly had an appreciation for small towns and uh, what it's like to live in, in, the, in, a, in the smaller smaller areas. And then you moved on, uh, Jim. Yes, Jim ran for the U.S. Senate. He opposed in the primary, he opposed Howard Cannon, and he lost in the primary. And then Howard Cannon lost in the general to Chick Hecht. I don't know if you remember, he was a one-term senator. But uh, that was a devastating loss because uh, the three of us, uh, another fellow by the name of Jim Chachis, who had been our, our rural representative, who was from Ely, a great Nevada family, Greek family, um, and Susan Lynn, who had been his uh, kind of rural and worked on public land issues and was very environmentally <laughs> well educated in the environment and was a pro advocate of the environment. Um, so there was Susan, Kay, Fritzy, and Jim and I. And over eight years we had developed this wonderful friendship and, um, and really truly enjoyed our jobs and really believed in Santini that he did a wonderful job for the state of Nevada. So when he lost it was, it was quite tragic and uh, then it was thinking about, I knew I wanted to continue working, so I had to go out and beat the pavement and uh, try to find another job. And that's when I ended up at Sierra Pacific Power Company. And I was a community information representative. And it, it was a job that was a little bit difficult for me because I had been running an office, had been very independent, and uh, moved into a rather structured uh, environment and did a lot of organizing of lunches and things like that but it, it, it wasn't nearly as challenging uh, great company wonderful people but just wasn't as challenging for me while I was still there I had a job offer from Harris and so I went to Harris and was a, a public affairs uh, director of public affairs was my title there and they had, Phil Satry was the uh, CEO of Harris, and uh, my boss was a gentleman by the name of Ron Jeffrey, who was from Australia, a delightful man who wore a little flower in his uh, lapel every day. Um, but Harris was, then I was into a whole new industry uh, of gaming and hotel. And the hotel part I loved, um, gaming was a little harder to, to grasp. But again, uh, I served on the executive committee for Harris Reno, and it was a, a wonderful group of talented uh, people who were in the gaming, uh, who worked in gaming for Harris, uh, with a really wonderful, compassionate gentleman uh, who was our uh, our uh, general manager. His name was Ron Jeffrey, as I'd mentioned. But one of the things that uh, I did at Harris, I was really able to get involved in the community extensively. Well, at Sierra Pacific, we started the Nevada Women's Fund, which was significant. And I always credit Sierra Pacific and corporations who allow their employees to do uh, these other projects. And Sierra Pacific, uh, or now Nevada Power, uh, deserves all sorts of credit for allowing me, and there were a few other people who were involved in the Women's Fund, because that's when we really got it started and they allowed us time and they also supported the Women's Fund financially. Uh, moving on to Harris, uh, they were supporters of the Women's Fund, but that's where uh, my boss was very interested in education and we started the first Adopt-a-School program uh, in Reno. And I met with, uh, I worked with the Chamber of Commerce and met with uh, the superintendent of schools and it was just being introduced and some people were a little 
concerned, you know, about gaming or about corporations getting into education, but you can tell from today, Partners in Education is a, it, it changed from adopt a school to Partners in Education, and it's uh, an extensive program in the Washoe County School District. But we were really, we adopted Trainer, and I had taught at Trainer, as I mentioned, when I started my career in teaching. And um, the, the students there really appreciated, and the faculty, wonderful faculty, and they really appreciated all that we could do for them. And we would have banquets, or you know, we donated money to them for equipment. And I spent time in the classroom. They had a leadership class where I would go in and teach, and help uh, the students and talk about leadership because leadership is a, a real passion of mine. And. Uh, so it, it was uh, really significant, and we did uh, a lot of good things in the community. Um, Harris was a very good um, partner with, uh, with any community activity. I think, as you, as you know, they were uh, really good about supporting different activities. So, uh, and that was also, um, about that time, I was also involved heavily with United Way. and. Uh, I uh, was chairman of the board of United Way, and we embarked on one of the first homeless projects. To uh, we got a grant from Robert Wood Johnson to, um, or no, it was from Gannett, excuse me, uh, to um, fund. It was about a half a million dollars to fund housing and different uh, food and babysitting and uh, first month's deposit. Uh, many homeless people would say families. We were really focusing on families that they couldn't get into an apartment because they couldn't afford the first and last month's rent. So this program um, helped them with their deposits. But, and then we also started working on you know, trying to get a homeless shelter, which <laughs> went on for year after year after year. But uh, the homeless were an in issue in downtown Reno, and you know it's been this perennial issue of trying to clean up the downtown. And, do some things uh, because there is a fair number. There are a fair number of homeless people who just kind of hang out in downtown Reno. They get their Social Security check and check into a motel or hotel for two weeks, then their money's gone, and then they're they're back on the street. But we actually did a survey of the homeless in uh, in in the Truckee Meadows area and found out that a huge percentage of them were Vietnam veterans and who had been there and come home and there were no services for them and they were mentally um, needing services for mental health purposes and the, the services just weren't there or they couldn't you know stay with the, the health care they needed they couldn't make that commitment to stay so for a variety of reasons they were on the street but did you run into a lot of homeless families there were uh, a lot of homeless families and and as you know being a teacher the, the turnover rate and transient rate in schools is, you know, 112 percent in some of the schools in Reno. So we do have a lot of transiency um, in, in the school district, which is really challenging for the district itself, the teachers, and certainly hard on families. But I think they come thinking they can get work, and there are jobs. Um, but um, there's so much more that's needed. You know, they need a better education, they need a, a teaching and training on how to keep, get a job and then keep a job, be on time, how to dress, and all these different things. So homelessness is, uh, is a many-pronged program, program that takes a lot to address. And um, at Harris then, you worked with the community. Uh-huh. And um, I really did a lot of outreach in the community, and Harris was was very supportive of that. Um, there was a program um, that uh, had been um, administered in, in San Antonio that they they really kind of it was a rebirth of the city. They did redid the river. They did all the restaurants along the river, and. Uh, so there were uh, efforts at that time with the Chamber of Commerce and with Mark Curtis Sr., uh, who was in marketing at, at Harris. He was just getting ready to retire, but I was blessed to have a few years to be able to work with Mark Curtis, who was uh, a true icon in, 
in public relations and just as an overall good guy. But uh, we worked on um, trying to clean up this, the downtown and think of ideas to, to uh, renovate Reno. And, uh, so, and there have been many committees <laughs> since then. And it seems that there, that, that issue still is going on and, and trying to be addressed. And how did you work with the uh, Chamber of Commerce and the, well, the Reno City, uh, City Council? Uh, I didn't, I just did a little bit of government affairs, but mainly um, I was the re uh, relationship builder. So we would have um, them to events. We also, I started these kind of awareness programs of what gaming was like and what running a hotel was like. And we would invite people from the uh, community and civic leaders, uh, community representatives to um, understand the business of gaming and how you ran a hotel and, and the economic impact, and which many of them knew you know, a little bit about but really couldn't appreciate. And then they <clears throat> were introduced to our senior staff, so it became more personal for them. And um, they were really well received uh, and I think did, did help in uh, getting people a little better educated about gaming. And you worked <coughs> for one of the last private ownership uh, gaming establishment. Well, actually, it was owned by Holiday Inn when I At was there. At that time. Mm -hmm. It was called, well, the company was called Promus, P-R-O-M-U-S. And uh, so it, it wasn't, I wasn't there in the Bill Hara days when Bill Hara owned Harris. But there are many, many stories about Bill Hara. He didn't show up to a meeting late. <laughs> So they actually, uh, and I was going to compare uh, Harris as private ownership and the responsibility into the community. Uh -huh. The Holiday Inn then continued that. Well, yes, and that was, Holiday was very good. And uh, in fact, um, I was selected really by Phil Satry to represent <coughs> Harris um, and part of the Holiday Inn uh, umbrella, um, but I represented Harris and went to New York to the YWCA Academy of Women Achievers. And this was a huge event that the YWCA used as a fundraiser and made uh, several hundred thousand dollars. But it was a great day. I, uh, they took us on a tour of New York, took us to the Y, uh, did these briefings, and then had this spectacular luncheon in a hotel and honored all these women. And it was from there that I got the idea, came home and said, Women's Fund, we have got to do a Woman of Achievement event. And I, I think it was called A Salute to Women of Achievement in uh, New York. So uh, the YWC was active at that time. So we, want, we, were, we had to be sensitive about the Reno YWCA and uh, the connection to that and then the Women's Fund kind of taking it over, but it turned out to be fine, and they were uh, fine with the Women's Fund putting it on. So, so I did the first Women of Achievement, and, uh, which, uh, and designed the model of how we would uh, pull that off, and that the, the, the companies would choose their representatives. They would choose their uh, Women of Achievement. The Women's Fund didn't do that, but you got corporations, nonprofits, and others to select the woman of achievement. And this was something I felt very strongly about because uh, I think in the workplace, um, men are, there are a lot of men, and they seem to be <laughs> recognized <laughs> more often. And women uh, tended not to be recognized. So that was a, a main, a, a significant purpose of the Women of Achievement event that we wanted to recognize women in the workplace for what they had done. And uh, then your CEO had to come with you, and uh, which the CEOs were great, or the leader of the organization if it wasn't a CEO. But they came to with the honoree, and uh, uh, you know, we, when you look at that dais and you see uh, uh, 100, 150 women sitting up there with their, um, with someone from their company or organization. It's pretty impressive. Yes, it is. 
And then you went to the Washoe Health System. Uh -huh. I was at, I, uh, my career path was five years at Harris. And uh, they had uh, changed, reorganized. And Harris Reno and Harris Tahoe came under the same uh, CEO or general manager, really. And so I had to commute to Tahoe, to Harris Tahoe. And I felt that it was fine, but uh, there really wasn't a lot for me to do there. And uh, it's a very different community, you know, if, particularly if you're going to do community uh, uh, outreach a lot. So um, at that time, uh, Jim Lamb was the CEO of Washoe Health System. And that's the parent, was the parent company of Washoe Medical Center. And um, he approached me about coming to work uh, for Washoe Health System. And that, I've always been interested in health care. I worked in a hospital when I was going through high school and college, and uh, health care had been an interest. So then I moved from Harris uh, to uh, Washoe Health System as a, a vice president. And I wanted to be a vice president. And uh, that was my career path. And what in the Washoe Health System? Well, now it's named Renown, but there were, uh, it had uh, hometown Health was part of it. They had uh, an assisted living. South Meadows was an assisted living facility uh, at that time and still is. Um, they had um, clinics. They had the Washoe Pregnancy Center. And that was a big attraction for me. And I, as I learned more about the Pregnancy Center, that they made sure that low-income women received prenatal care because there's a huge factor in if if you're receiving prenatal care, chances are your baby will be born healthy. And um, studies were done and discovered that many, many women in the area did not have access to a, an obstetrician for prenatal care. So I really credit Washoe with uh, saving many children and giving many women uh, uh, the, the proper care in starting this program. And it was a group uh, of private uh, practice obstetricians who uh, partnered with Washoe Med and uh, to put the program on and it was a reduced fee for their delivery and then they even had home health nurses after the babies were born to go out to the home to make sure that they were uh, receiving you know they're being fed properly and uh, get, getting their vaccinations and so on but it, it that was a program I was particularly proud of. And does that continue? Yes, they, they still, it's not in the form that it was when I was there, but they're still doing it. And then of course, that was also when we started Baby Your Baby, <laughs> and I did a number of uh, TV spots. We partnered with Channel 4, too. And that was a program that Sandy Miller, the governor's wife, was very, uh, she had heard about it. They had done it in other states, and she wanted to bring it to Reno, again, to address prenatal care issues and uh, young infant issues. And so uh, we worked with, I uh, worked with Sandy and, and we developed this uh, program along with Channel 4 of Baby Your Baby to um, raise awareness to um, children's issues. And other activities in the... Well, in Harris, the Harris, when I was at Harris, uh, I became the first woman to uh, serve on the Economic Development Commission. Governor Bob Miller uh, appointed me to the commission when I was there. Um, so that was, again, a whole new area that I had explored um, to learn about companies relocating and, and uh, what meant mattered to them. I'd always been concerned that we advertised ourselves as a no-tax state. You know, if that's all you can say about yourself, that you're no-tax, because uh, we also didn't have much revenue. <laughs> and uh, if you're not providing some kind of revenue, then quality of life for people is is not that great because you need some money to, you know, to have good schools and to have a good infrastructure and do these things. So, um, the Economic Development Commission got away from that no tax uh, mantra and really looked more. They developed an incentive program and they did start it, start giving uh, incentives to companies to locate. But it wasn't a total giveaway, and uh, there were criteria you had to meet. You had to pay a certain wage, and it was a good wage, not you know, not because we have a lot of minimum wage jobs. We didn't need more minimum wage jobs. But I served on the 
because of I filled an unexpired term and then I had could serve two or three more terms. I ended up serving on the commission for about 16 years, I think, 14 years. But uh, that was also a very good experience and also uh, always appreciated Bob Miller and for appointing me. Now there have been several women who've served, but I was the first. I was somewhat prepared to serve on the commission because I had been the president of WIN, Western Industrial Nevada, and that organization was formed years ago. Frank Bender was a, a major driver of that in Dermody. Uh, it was when we started warehousing, and Reno really became a hub for warehousing and distribution. And then, um, oh, when I was actually at the power company, um, an effort was started to expand, to, to move, uh, to develop our own economic development authority in um, the Truckee Meadows area. And that's when EDON was born, the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada, so that you actually had an organization that was going out and recruiting businesses to locate here. And the big scare then was, uh, and I think you'll probably recall in the 70s, 80s, uh, it would, you'd see the big headline, Is Nevada Recession Proof? And we did go through a couple recessions and we took, depended on gaming. And when gaming was impacted, you know, um, the other industries, mining, et cetera, weren't uh, that prevalent, so couldn't support the state. So we really had to look to diversify and bring in other industries. And EDON, um, when it was created, and it, but it came through when the Western Industrial Nevada really created EDON and a group of, of leaders who uh, did research and, and uh, figured out how to go about creating a, a development authority. So, <clears throat> um, so I served on the WIN board and I was at Harris uh, when I did that. And uh, uh, Harris had done the William F. Harris lecture series with the University of Nevada for a number of years. And that kind of fizzled somewhat. So we, we changed the Harris lecture series to bring in speakers um, um, of, of prominence as the lecture series had, but we committed part of that money to go to EDON. And so I thought it was admirable that gaming <laughs> would step up and, and work on diversification. So I served as president of, of EDON for two years. And, um, um, and so that all tied into serving on the Nevada Commission on Economic Development. Um, and <clears throat> That good work continues. Uh, I think Edon is really doing well now. They have an excellent executive director and they're very involved in education. And uh, another interest uh, grew out of being involved in uh, economic development and listening to companies and, and getting away from this, uh, you know, you don't have to pay any taxes if you come here. <laughs> because companies, who the good companies that wanted to locate here wanted quality schools, they wanted the arts, they wanted something to do, they liked ballet or a philharmonic or an opera, and they wanted a good infrastructure, They wanted because they were moving here, they were gonna live here, and uh, they wanted a, a good quality of life. And from my years involved with uh, Edon and uh, looking at, at uh, economic development and attracting companies, um, I worked in, when I was at Washoe Health System, we started in a, a group called Truckee Meadows Tomorrow. And this was a lot of different organizations in the community, but the idea was to start looking at quality of life indicators of when, because uh, when site selection people look at a community, they have indicators. They know what your rate, graduation rate is from, from high school. Uh, they know what it's going to cost for to go to the University of Nevada for an education. They know infrastructure. They know taxes. They know all sorts of numbers about your community. And they know health numbers. And what tied into Washoe Health System so significantly was our terrible health numbers. You know, we had more people who smoked, uh, too many people drank. And uh, so our health status as a state was, was pretty grim. And so the concept of Truckee Meadows Tomorrow was to 
as a community, develop these indicators of quality of life. Uh, what should they be? And uh, should it be prenatal care? <clears throat> should it be um, the dropout rate and work on improving all these indicators? Um, I have to tell you, it was really a challenge <laughs> to, to embark on that. And I think some people never really got it, what we were trying to do. But it's still, Chucky Meadows Tomorrow is still in existence. They are still working on improving the community, and uh, I have to hand it to them for, uh, for the great work they've done. We did uh, do a, an event each year, and I kind of modeled it after uh, Women of Achievement, but it was called Accentuate the Positive, and it was a celebration of the community. And we tend many times to talk about what's wrong with the Truckee Meadows or Reno or Sparks and, or Nevada, but not what's right. And there are a whole lot of things that are very right about where we live. So this was an annual celebration that we would accentuate the positive about our community. And we had organizations uh, uh, select people in their work environments again who accentuated the positive and really helped quality of life in, 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 within their business or in the community. So we did that for about five years and it, it was uh, an, an excellent event and very uplifting to hear all the good things and the good things people were doing in the community. What motivates you or keeps you going? Well, I don't know. I, it's hard to say. I think some of that is innate. <laughs> that you just have a drive to do things. and. One thing that I've learned, uh, and I studied leadership, uh, one of my favorite authors is, uh, and this is my, my Bible, that I took all through my career. It's called The Leadership Challenge by Kuzes and Posner. And um, one of the, the five key aspects of leadership is uh, challenging the process, that you're not afraid to take a stand, and I have done that in the workplace and sometimes it has not been to my benefit but I'm a person if I see something and I don't think it's right I am willing to speak up. Um, the other, another one is to uh, be a risk taker, to not fear failing and I am not, I am a risk taker. Obviously a lot of these things uh, uh, when we started the, uh, a group of uh, African American young people came to me. They had done one celebration for Martin Luther King and I was at Harris at the time and uh, they needed help. So uh, off we went <laughs> and uh, I was very willing to take the challenge to establish that as a uh, premier event for our community but it also is became one that in this whole U.S. it's one of the top Martin Luther King celebrations in the country. Um, our first speaker was um, Roger Wilkes, who was in the Johnson administration. I happened to go to a conference in Boston and he was a speaker there. So I went up to him and said, would you consider coming to Reno, Nevada at, to speak to our, Mar at, be the speaker at our Martin Luther King dinner, which he agreed to do. And so our first celebration was, was really excellent. I have two, two black children. I have Andre Berry. I don't have a picture of Angie Taylor. Angie Taylor is the uh, chairman of the uh, school board. But they are my children, um, and I have mentored for them, and they're just wonderful uh, people. I have learned more about the African-American black community and the importance of church. And it's just uh, probably one of the most special things I was able to do was to work with them and to help establish that event and to, to mentor for them over the years. And so obviously um, a challenge is something that you willingly take on. What about role models? Did you have people along the way that led you into different areas that you might not have gone into? I think the, the, a role model that really was important to me was my mother <laughs> because uh, she became a single head of household. She had to raise uh, my brother. My sisters were gone at that time, my twin sisters, uh, but uh, my brother and I were still at home. My brother's 10 years younger than I am. Um, 
and she went, um, she just carried on. Uh, and uh, fortunately, she was well educated and uh, she could get good jobs, but uh, so she could um, support us uh, in the way we, we should. But we didn't have everything, and um, that, and I worked every year, every summer I worked in, in high school and college, and I always had a job, and that was a really important part of the development of my life. Another uh, mentor who um, was uh, Marge Scott, who I mentioned earlier when I went to train her. Uh, Marge Titus Scott. Uh, Marge went to Reno High. She married Bob Scott, who was superintendent. Of, he was a Reno High graduate also, who uh, <clears throat> was superintendent of schools in Humboldt County for a number of years. But Marge wasn't married at the time. She was Marge Titus, and she uh, was... Uh, headed up the PE department at uh, at Trainer, So she and I became very good friends and she really did become uh, a role model. But actually I have to go back, I forgot. She was my PE teacher in high school. And then when uh, when I went to Trainer to teach, she was uh, my colleague. <laughs> so that was fun. But uh, Marge certainly was. Uh, and um, there, there have been uh, a number of uh, Sue Wagner has certainly been special, um, and a woman I think who has shown enormous courage and and uh, um, is a true believer and a true advocate for women. Um, Mary Bell Batcher, uh, she her father was my teacher in Carson City in the sixth grade, so the Batcher girls have. Uh, have known, and um, Mary Bell was also at Harris, and so we had somewhat in common there. But Mary Bell is is is, is truly a, a a model for all women. She's accomplished so much in the political side of things, but also working in uh, gaming and other areas. So <clears throat> those are just a few. Have you had any transformative experiences? That brought you where you are today. I don't think that just uh -huh. shook you up and and made a change in your life. Well, I think um, a change that occurred was when my husband finished his training, and we moved back to Reno, and he set up his practice. Um, it soon became very clear that he was going to have a very full life with his practice. And um, that I realized in raising children, we have three children, and that was great, but they didn't need me all the time. And I think that's when I decided that I needed to get a life of my own. And that has proven to be um, very important. I'm sure if you ask my children, there are times when they would say, you know, where was mom? Uh, I re they, in fact, they tell me, I remember the time, mom, that you forgot to pick me up because you were at some meeting and I was standing in front of Swope Junior High waiting for a ride home. But um, all in all, I think today my children would say, good for you, mom, that you did have that great career and you did do the things that you wanted and you have a life and you have an identity because uh, I think that that's critical for, for people to have their own identity. So what have you learned? Um, did you have obviously failures in, uh, in your Absolutely, life? Absolutely, yeah. As well as successes. What, right. have, what do you, have you really learned from your life experiences? Oh, I think it's just go for it, you know, and don't fret too much about what's going to go wrong and <laughs> um, that if you do you just get bogged down and you miss a lot of opportunities and I can remember doing job proposals that I thought I would be just terrific at <laughs> and being turned down when I was between engagements <laughs> between jobs um, and uh, but it it made me um, it, it pulled um, on experiences that I had, it made me really think about what I wanted to do, what I was good at, and it was another form of risk taking. And um, I, I just think if you're going to sit around, then not much is going to happen in your life. So you got to go for it. And 
and I, that's what I've tried to do. Outside of the importance to your family, and you certainly are important, how would you like to be remembered? Well, uh, it's, it is very important to uh, be remembered that we had a great family and we had a lot of fun as a family because we do. Our children are our friends and um, we have fun parties. We love to dress up in costumes. First of all, here's, here's our family. With, we have eight grandchildren and uh, we had three children. They all have good marriages and they, uh, we have a lot of fun. And there's hardly a moment that we don't have something that doesn't require a costume. <laughs> Uh, we love to dress up in, in costumes, and here's uh, a birthday party of my husband's. This was a Western theme. This was a Washoe party. Here I am as a Elizabethan prince, princess. <laughs> in terms of being remembered, I, I would hope people would think that there are some things that are better because I had some small involvement with them, and that's whether it's the Women's Fund and the scholarships that we provided and, and uh, what it's doing for women in this community. That the Truckee Meadows Tomorrow is still going on, the, the Martin Luther King dinner is still going on and uh, celebrating, uh, I think, uh, an absolutely marvelous person who, um, who we learned so much from. And also to think about discrimination and uh, how awful that is and how we need to make everybody feel comfortable in our communities. And our, our African American community is really quite small, um, but uh, it's, it's certainly quite vibrant. And I, <clears throat> I, um, I was involved in the Philharmonic, um, and I think arts and culture are really important um, to this community. But overall, I think we, we live in a great place, and there are so many things that we've been able to do in this, in Reno, that they haven't been able to duplicate in Las Vegas. Uh, and I think uh, it, it's truly special here, and, and that you can do it. In some large community, you know, you get buried in the masses of, the, you don't have those opportunities, but certainly I did. and, and uh, it, it's been a wonderful part of my life. I feel very blessed. You haven't really spoken about the Terry Wells Foundation, and I know that uh -huh. that has done a tremendous amount of good in in this area. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The Terry Lee Wells Foundation, uh, Terry Lee was in school behind me at Reno High School. She was a couple years behind me. And uh, her, Terry's from the Wells Trucking family. And they, um, um, they're an old pioneer Nevada family, um, bought a lot of land when they were out trucking around the state, found uh, sites of land they could buy, and the family became quite wealthy uh, with land purchases and then had a, a vibrant trucking business. And Terry Lee, unfortunately, died very young and very unexpectedly. She had just uh, received a, 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 a a significant amount of money from, I believe, from land sales, but or inheritance, and um, bless her heart. Um, before she died, she had uh, it was about eleven million dollars, I believe, and she <clears throat> wanted that wanted to set up a foundation. She didn't want to keep the money for herself, buy a fancy house or whatever. She wanted to set up a foundation. So she and her cousin. Don Wells, who was of Gilligan's Island, who was also a Reno High graduate, and a dear friend of hers, Eloise Esser, uh, set up the foundation, working with uh, law firms and, and so on. So the foundation uh, was created and had been in existence for four or five years. Uh, they had taken on Charlotte McConnell as a trustee, and then they decided they wanted to take on two more trustees. So I uh, became part of it. I've been on it about five years, six years. And um, uh, we uh, are primarily geared to grants for women and children, but do other types of, support other types of activities. But uh, our big project was the uh, Nevada Discovery Museum. And in terms of downtown and a uh, a magnet for the downtown area, taking that city of Reno building and putting it, you know, 
making it into something that was a real attraction for uh, our community um, was uh, was a real plus. So we're in the foundation has contributed close to five million to the Discovery Museum. It's doing very well. It has an excellent executive director, and uh, just really proud that that's another uh, real positive uh, addition to our community that's wonderful for the school district, wonderful for families. And, and it's, it's not a children's museum. It's geared to uh, young children to 12, 14 years of age. There's, uh, it's really more, uh, there's a lot of science uh, and tech in it. So it's, uh, it, it crosses uh, a number of ages. It's not just, uh, you know, go fun, uh, have fun little children's museum, which are important and fun for some communities, but this, this is a little different. Well, it's, a, it's an excellent interactive mm -hmm. yes. uh, experience mm -hmm. for the parents and their children mm -hmm. that I have noticed. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's definitely a real plus. In summation, because we of uh, the Nevada Women's History Project are trying to uh, interview women um, that have done many things high profile, low profile, mm -hmm. but what would be your message for a young woman of today? Well, you know, I look at my granddaughters for message to, to young women, and I, I think about my granddaughters, who one is it, a, a, a sophomore in college now, soon to be a junior, and then I think of all the young women who I had the good fortune to have associations with, and I always, uh, took time to be a mentor for women. Many women would, or not many, but there would be people who would come to town and they would need somebody to talk to about what was going on or about career path. I always took time to meet with them. And I think it's important for women to do that, to share their time with other women. Um, I always said um, that don't worry a lot about what your job is going to be tomorrow. Uh, prepare yourself to be a good writer, <laughs> be a good listener, take some accounting classes, have some basic understanding of, of math and, and uh, accounting, uh, if you're going to go on the business side. Um, and then, you know, go for it. Just go for your, uh, take on jobs that you may not think you would want to do because you just don't know. Uh, how they're going to uh, add to your overall experience. And even when I was um, teaching leadership and we'd talk about um, you would have three to five career changes in your, in your lifetime, seven to ten job changes, and I believe many of those are still the same today. So your career is going to change as mine did. I was very fortunate. I wasn't trained to be a uh, vice president of marketing communications. I didn't take any marketing classes or journalism or public relations, but I ended up in that position. Uh, I wasn't trained for a lot of things that I ended up doing to run a congressional office, but uh, but opportunities come up, and if you can, you know, if you are able to converse, if you are able to write well um, and um, have some a basic understanding of numbers you'll probably do very well. And then you do need mentors. And Fred Davis, I didn't manage well, Fred Davis at the Chamber of Commerce, but I had several men mentors, and Fred certainly was one. He was wonderful uh, to me and to make sure that I was included in things and uh, put on committees. And you need people to help along that way. Um, I, I think in my career, I've had worked with Jane Torres, who's at the University of Nevada now, but Jane's from Lovelock. Jane and I worked together at Harris. Then she came over, um, sort of stole her to come over to Washoe Health System, and then she went on from there to the University of Nevada. But uh, Carrie Garcia, uh, who is at uh, the, she's actually at the uh, the university now and uh, Denise Yoxheimer. I had these wonderful young women who were uh, in my department who I really felt were more like my daughters than employees and have uh, been able to uh, be with them for many years and feel that I was, I had a responsibility 
to mentor as well as, you know, be sort of your boss and, and your friend. <laughs> um, is there anything you'd like to add? If I don't think so. <laughs> I think I've talked plenty. <laughs> Then, Unless, thank you very much. Oh. We certainly appreciated the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>